got another repair video for you. Um, here, what I've got is the Model 1 Sega CD. So I'm going to show you how to open this thing up, uh, a couple things to check for, and we'll uh, get a bunch of repairs done on this. So first thing to do here is going to be to actually show you how to hook it up. So Model 1 Sega Genesis is this version here, which has a slide-out drawer. And I'm going to compare it to a Model 2 Sega Genesis, or sorry, Sega CD which is this one here, which has this pop open door here. Um, so obviously you can see there are rather significant differences between the two. The Model 1 was designed for the Model 1 Sega Genesis and the Model 2 CD was designed oops, with the Model 2 Sega Genesis in mind. So um, in sticking true to the spirit of this, I'm going to connect it to my Model 1 Sega Genesis. So first thing you're going to do, if you happen to have this metal plate that came with your Sega CD, you need to screw it on to the back of your Sega Genesis. So um, you'd screw it on with the screw that came with it right here, and it will just slide into place. And this is what helps it latch into place on that Sega CD. Next step, just put them together and slide it until it clicks. On the side here, there's a little lock mechanism, which I think is supposed to hold it in place, but doesn't really seem to do anything. So I'm not really sure what the purpose of that is. Anyways, um, next thing you want to do is actually hook it up to the TV. So this is where it can kind of start becoming a bit of a pain. What I've collected here are all the cords that you might need to hook up a Sega Genesis and a Sega CD. And just to make matters more complicated, I'm even gonna include my Sega 32X into here. So plug that in and flip it over. I'm gonna show you how all the hookups work. So as you can see here, on the back of all of these models, there is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven inputs. Um, not all of them are gonna be used, but Actually, most of them are going to be used. So, the very first thing we're going to do is get the cords I need for the Sega Genesis or the Sega CD. So, the Sega CD will actually use the same type of power cord as a Generation 1 Sega Genesis. So, I'm going to plug that in there, and we've got our power. Next is the 32X, and we need this patch cable in order to connect the two. So since I'm connecting to a Model 1 Sega Genesis, I need the wider end and the smaller end for the 32X. So I plug that in there, and this will connect into the AV in port. Just like so. Next, we're going to get power for the Sega Genesis, like so. We're going to connect the AV cable, which is the same AV cable which will come with the Model 2 Sega Genesis. We're going to connect that to the AV out on the Sega 32X. So one thing I want to make note of here is with the Model 1 Sega Genesis and the 32X and the CD, um, it actually won't output audio through these cables. So I'm going to plug it in to show you, but you're going to get video, but no audio. Um, so let's get power. Power for the 32X is the same as a Model 2 Sega Genesis. So we plug in our power, uh, flip it over, and pretty much good to go. So I'm going to plug this into the TV and show you what it looks like with that setup. Okay, so for the first example, all I'm going to do is use a 32X game, turn it on. So you'll see that we're getting video here, but no audio coming out of the TV. And turn the volume up. It's at 15 already, so you should be hearing the sounds of NBA Jam.
still nothing. So let's turn that off. We'll get rid of the cartridge and turn it back on so that we can boot from the Sega CD. So we're loading up the Sega CD BIOS here. And I'm getting nothing, no sound, but I do have video. So like I said, when you have this particular combination put together, Model 1 Sega, Ge Model 1 Genesis, Model 1 Sega CD and a 32X, um, the 32X actually won't output any sound through the AV out. So I'm gonna show you what you have to do next. So we look on the back here and on the back of this Sega CD, you'll notice there's uh, some audio output ports here. So what we're gonna do is just use a couple RCA cables, plug in to the red and the white, and then on the TV side, rather than using the AV cable that came with the Sega, we're gonna unplug the red and the white and plug in the other end of these ones. So the black in this case is gonna be red and the white will be white. We'll plug that in in its place and I'll show you what happens then. So having now plugged the back into going from the RCA cables on the Sega CD to the TV, I'm gonna show you what booting a Sega 32X game does. So still no audio at all. Um, choose head to head, go into a game. I'm not getting anything. Turn this off, remove the cartridge, turn it back on. We'll boot into the CD BIOS. So we are getting sound, but it's pretty bad. See, we're starting to get a bit of a drum loop now, and it's going to come back with some more sound, but it really just sounds atrocious. So it sounds like something missing. So I'm not going to lie to you, first time I turned this on with that same very configuration, um, I thought it was broken. I thought that maybe there was something wrong with a circuit where one of the audio channels wasn't coming in and it was missing something. Um, that's until I found I was missing one more cable. So in the case of the Model 1 Sega Genesis, um, how it actually works is the Sega CD will instruct the Genesis to do a lot of the video handling itself. It outputs the video then, in this case, through the 32X and then out to the TV. Um, the problem though is a lot of the audio is handled by the Sega Genesis, but the port in the back, firstly it only outputs mono sound, and it also doesn't output proper sound through the connector here into the Sega CD. Now a Model 2 Sega Genesis actually does output the proper audio to the Sega CD. So what you actually need is another cable. Um, Sega calls this the mixing cable. Really all it is is just a 1 8th or sorry, a 8th inch stereo jack or stereo plug, but you plug it into the headphone jack at the front here and then go all the way around the Sega CD and you will see that right here, I don't know if you can see that, there we go. Right here there's another jack and it's labeled mixing. You need to plug the other end of that aux cable right into there. So what this will now do is Sega CD tells the Sega Genesis to create sound. The sound is routed through the stereo plug into the back of the Sega CD and then it goes out to the TV using the RCA plugs on the back. So I'm going to start it up now and show you the difference. Okay, so now that we've got it all set up again, um, let's turn it on and show you what we got. So as you can hear, there's already much better sound. It's playing a mixing of different uh, audio layers here rather than just the one. 
You can hear there's kind of some background layers, there's highs, there's lows, there's a drum track. Just sounds a lot better. So fortunately, um, this particular system does not have faulty audio. Um, that was my first fear because, to be honest, I didn't know that you had to use this um, auxiliary cable here on the side, right there. I didn't know you had to connect that up, so that was a learning experience for both of us. So let's uh, let's put a CD in and just make sure that it kind of works properly. So if you've never used a Sega CD Model 1 before, you might notice that there's no eject buttons on it at all. So it took me a second to figure out how to open it until I realized on the screen it tells me to smooth this a bit. Press reset to open the CD tray. So we're gonna do just that. Press reset. And CD tray's open. So we're gonna try Sonic CD as the first game. This is one of the uh, classic and arguably best Sonic games in the franchise. Uh, depends who you talk to, but really quite an excellent game. Now, to close this, hitting reset won't do the trick. You actually have to use your controller and push start. So it's going to read the disc. You can see the access light going. <clears throat> and there we go. We're booting into the game. So looks like it's playing pretty well. Um, I'm not noticing any type of graphical issues and it's not making noise, which is good. Sometimes if you've got bad spindles or, um, actually let's turn the volume down a little bit. Or actually, I could probably use this volume. Not really. So as I was saying, sorry, sometimes if you've got bad spindle in the uh, CD mechanism, you might get some uh, creaking or sounds like it's skipping, but fortunately that doesn't seem to be the case. So I want to do just a quick kind of run through here. It's successfully kind of switching into the quasi 3D mode. It seems to be keeping up pretty well, I'm not getting any lag, no slowdown, no freezing, anything like that. So. I'm content with this in saying that it seems to be functional. However, um, functional and working properly are two different things. So there's a couple of things in the Sega CD that I want to open up and check out. Um, these are notorious for having bad capacitors and as well there's a, a coin cell battery inside which is used to maintain save games. And just like every other single type of equipment that has battery-powered save memory, those batteries are going to die eventually. So this console is probably probably came out, I'm going to say, 93, I think, 92. And it definitely needs to be replaced. I doubt, I'm willing to bet that the coin battery has never been replaced. So we're going to open it up and do a little preventative maintenance on this thing. Um... These are somewhat difficult to come across, and they're pretty expensive when you do. I managed to pick this up. I actually got it with a Sega and a couple of games for 40 bucks, but that was, I think, an absolute steal, and I'll probably never see a deal like that again. You can expect to pay anywhere from $100 to $150 for this system alone on somewhere like eBay or locally. Um, and even at that, there's no guarantee it's been maintained properly. It could be broken. It could have a bad laser. It could have bad capacitors, and it might fail a month after you're getting it. So it's a good idea, especially with these. We're going to open it up and try and uh, do some preventative maintenance. So first step for this is going to be let's crack this thing open. So there's eight screws that you're going to need to remove to get the case off, and two of them are located right above this pin connector here. So I'm going to use my... Phillips screwdriver, remove those two screws, set them off to the side. Now, flip the system over, and we've got the six on the back. So one, two, three, four, five, and six. So I'll remove those. So 
So screws are loosened. We're going to flip this over. Take those screws out. There should be six there, and there are. So, and we'll put all these aside. So the screws from the bottom are, they look to be brass screws, and the screws from that connector are black. So just make a note of that when you go to put them back. And then you're going to have to lift the top of this system up. First thing we do, kind of work the side out. And then you should be able to just lift it up and move it off. What we see here is two sets of RF shielding. Um, this is going to be the first one to come off, so there's a couple of screws you need to remove. I think three of them in total. Oops. This is where it comes in handy to have a magnetic screwdriver, which... Oops. There we go. And I dropped it again. There we go. So we should be able to lift this shielding up off to the side and we expose the optical drive here. So this particular model is a Sony optical drive. Um, they made two different versions, Sony, most of them are Sony, I think probably like 90% or more of them are made by Sony, and JVC makes the other smaller percent. Now apparently the JVC drives are better, um, they're, I guess they're just more durable, but um, we're still going to go through this, make sure that everything's greased up nicely, clean out, there's a couple of switches that you're going to want to clean out to make sure that there's no... Uh, issues with opening and closing the system and reading the discs and otherwise we're going to give it a general clean and this is the side that we're going to actually look at replacing some capacitors. So we're going to continue removing the RF shielding and again you're going to have a few more screws to remove. So with those screws removed, you're going to carefully lift this ribbon connector up. You want to be careful not to tear it or anything, so maybe easier to lift this back first and then pull it straight up from inside. There we go. And now we can put that shielding over to the side. So this is the board that we're looking at, and let's try and get a, I'm going to take this whole board off and give you a closer view about what we're looking at. So next we're going to need to remove this ribbon connector right here. And this is a little trickier to get to because it's pinned back in place here. So I think what I'm going to do is unscrew this connector on the side here just so that I have a little bit more play. So this, it's worth noting, the screw that I just took off has coarser screw threads than any of the other ones. So make a mental note of that, that bigger screws are holding down this connector because you're going to want to put those back in the right place. If you put them in the wrong spot, you'll probably end up stripping something. go. So now we can safely just pull this off and this is the board that we're most interested in. So this connector I can actually just take off and set it to the side. I'm going to clean the pins here probably but there shouldn't be anything inside here that requires attention. All this really does is passes a signal 
from down here to up here and vice versa. So this is the board that we're interested in. Let's try and zoom in a little bit and I'm going to show you what we're going to focus on. So there are two type of capacitors here. There are these ones that have these legs on them, which are actually mounted through the board. You put them through and you solder them into place. But then there are these surface mount capacitors right there where it says C49. These are the most prone to failure. They're incredibly unreliable. And down here is a good example. The best give on these is look around the grounding on the side here and look for any bubbling that's coming up on the side. So you can see it almost looks like it's starting to eat away at this gold here. I can probably scrape some of that back, but that's actually most likely a culprit of these capacitors leaking slightly. Um, they are notorious for that, so I'm actually going to go and replace all of these capacitors. Um, so in order to do that, I need to order a capacitor kit. It's probably going to take a few days to come in, but um, by opening it up, there are different capacitor kits you can buy. We know that this is a Sony model, so I'm going to buy the one for the Sony. Uh, this is the save battery, so this is another thing I'm going to work on. The save battery itself is held into place in three spots. So I have to desolder it one, two, and three, and then I can purchase another battery and put it into place there. Okay, so I just got my package of parts here. So I'm going to show you quickly what I got before we dive into this. So, um, firstly, I bought this stuff from a place called console5.com. Uh, they're a pretty good little site that sells a whole bunch of different uh, parts and stuff for retro games. So check it out if you uh, need to do a repair. They're pretty inexpensive. Shipping's reasonable even to Canada. And I don't know. I think I like them. Anyways, moving on. Um, first thing we got here is a capacitor kit. So this whole thing cost me about, I think, six bucks or something like that. So again, reasonably cheap considering that they did all the work for me in picking out what capacitors I need, replacements for all the ones in there, and they put it all here together for me. So um, again, pretty convenient. Got a couple uh, replacement drive belts. We got a replacement battery with a battery holder. So I'm gonna install this in place of these soldered in batteries. So in the future should 25 years later from now, should someone decide they want to replace it? Well, it's pretty straightforward. I bought a couple fuses. Um, I don't really think I'm gonna to need to use these, but on the off chance I blew something and I need to replace the fuse on this, here they are. So they were, I don't know, 30 cents, something like that. So really irrelevant in the overall scheme of things. Bought a replacement transistor, which same story as the fuses. Should something happen and have issues, um, I can go ahead and replace that. I bought another set of security screwdrivers. So these are the ones that will open up most, let's see if I can focus better. There we go. Open up most uh, Nintendo and Sega cartridges and consoles. So I already have one that I use, which is kind of like this. I just put the bit into any type of hex driver and use it, but it's always good to have another set so that um, something goes missing. I'm not kind of stuck. And another cool thing this place does, they send you a gumball. Um, you know, just some kind of nice little touch from them. So, got all my stuff. I'm going to show you uh, at this point right now how to replace the drive belt. Right, so now that we've got, uh, now that I have all my parts, time to resume uh, disassembly of this. So, um, first thing we're going to try and do is get this disk drive out. So, actually, very first thing is taking off the little cover here. All there is is just these little plastic tabs, so it should be able to lift out pretty easily. Just uh, try and be careful that you're not really forcing it and breaking anything, but that should come right out. Next, we got to get this uh, tray out. So, what you do for this is pretty easy. Um, you grab yourself a screwdriver or something, and there's a little gear right... Let me just try and show you. Right here, this black gear. What you want to do is using your screwdriver, turn that clockwise, and it will start ejecting out the tray. So you're gonna go as far as it will go until we get right to the end here, and then it should 
hit something and not go any further, just like that. So now there's a couple steps from here. Um, first thing, there's a little plastic tab right in this corner here that you can just pop up with something small and flat, just like that. And that helps to, I guess, lock it into place. So put that somewhere safe so that you don't lose it. Next is gonna be, there are two little um, locks right in the side here. So grabbing it with some tweezers and you can actually pull those out to the side. One right there and one right here. And this just helps to lock the tray into place. So to get this out, put a little bit of pressure on the tray, slide it out. The tray should move, do the other side. And then we should be able to lift up a bit and pull the tray straight up like that. Um, so a couple things to note, there are little uh, gear teeth on this tray so give it a once over make sure that none of those are broken um, otherwise that looks okay put that off to the side the last thing that we're going to want to do is to take this cover off here so take this cover and you push in a bit and it will lift up like that then you can slide it over and just work this thing off and this covers these gears and pulleys right here um, so there we have, so now it's a part and we've exposed uh, where this drive belt is. So this is one of the very first things that you're gonna wanna try and repair. Um, so while we have this open here, we're gonna do that. I've went ahead and I've ordered a couple extra drive belts. So I'm gonna pull off this one and I'm gonna show, compare it to a brand new one. So just simply lift it up, put it off to the side. I'm actually gonna move this and zoom in on these belts. So this is the one that we just took off here. Okay, now grab another brand new one and just put it beside it just for example. So as you can see this drive belt has stretched out a little bit. It's just uh, quite a bit looser. So we're going to replace that with a tight one. Um, it hadn't really been giving me any problems but this is a pretty common thing on a lot of different disk drive systems especially one that's pushing 25 years old. So all you want to do for this very carefully because this is a square band so you want to make sure that it's not twisted or anything when it's in here. Just put it over the pulleys and you should be able to get it sitting nicely. So just giving it a quick once over. I want to make sure that it's not twisting or anything and it looks good. Um, so yeah, so that's how to replace the drive belt. So reassembly can seem a little bit tricky, um, but it doesn't really have to be. First thing you wanna do is make sure that this wheel is spun all the way clockwise as far as it will go. Before I put the disc, the actual tray back in, it is um, sometimes an easier idea to put this front cover back on first. So. You're just going to line it up and it should just slide right into place like so. So now back to the tray again, clockwise as far as it will go. And it should rotate freely counterclockwise, but clockwise as far as you can go. And then you're going to line up the tray. So it should grab onto these teeth. And you can go ahead and push it straight in until you're all the way in there. Now, you're going to install this little black clip again, right in the back here, and that's in just like so. Then, um, it's as simple as reassembling everything, so we're going to get the, get this board put back on. Now this one can be a little tricky sometimes, because you have to get it just right with the, uh, extension attachment here so it can sometimes take a little bit of fidgeting and I'm gonna try and speed through this here so stand by and let's hopefully we can get this on working nicely um, so good idea is to start with this side ribbon connector and then we will try and hook it into here so
Okay, so that seems to be pretty good. Um, so a couple things to note once again is when reinstalling these screws, there are two screws here with coarse threads and a few with fine threads. So the coarse threads you want to put in, um, which hold in this extension attachment. Um, my dog has now picked, now is a good time to play with herself in a ball, so that's that sound you hear. Maybe she'll make a cameo a little bit later. I just realized I forgot to put this cover back on. So um, we're going to test this first to make sure that it works properly, but I'm going to have to go back and put this cover in. So it involves taking the tray out, putting it on, and then putting the tray back in. So um, I'm actually going to quickly do the tray right now and try and get that done. Okay, so we've got that back in place. Um, the last part here before we go and test this is to reinstall this cover here. Screw that on. So we're going to plug it in. I really just want to test to make sure that the drive ejects properly and retracts back in. So let's put this cover just temporarily in place and test it out. So. Take this lock completely out. All right, let's plug it in, see what we got. All right, so we've got it hooked up here quickly and let's just try a quick test. So we're getting sound. Should shortly say press reset to open the CD tray, so reset. Doesn't seem to quite like that, so let's try it again. Start to close. Seems to be having a hard time, so let's try it one more time. Hmm. Almost wonder if that band was a little too tight or if something's interfering, so I'm gonna probe around with that for a bit and see if. I can get that working a bit nicer. Alright, so I've figured out what I've done here, and um, I guess I just didn't really take note of when I took this apart the first time. So, firstly, Kona really wants to say hi, so this is my repair assistant today. Um, back to the Sega CD though, so you'll note on the bottom of here there's two little notches right there and there and then on this shielding there's the same little cutouts here and here um, this is actually supposed to go on the 
outside of the shielding. I was trying to go inside, which is where that friction was coming from, but outside apparently is the way to go. So line up those notches there. It should slide nicely over top and then clip it into place. So now you can see there's lots of space between the gear and that shielding. Um, so there should be absolutely no contact at all. And yeah, that's moving nicely. So reassemble the drive once again, turn this as far clockwise as possible, put the tray in, go all the way in, put that little lock piece down here at the back. And make sure everything's kind of straight here. Screw this back together and time for hopefully the final test. All right, so time for hopefully the final test of this. Um, after repairing the drive belt and figuring out that cover, time to try it out. So turn it on, say hi again. Press reset. There we go, that's coming out pretty nicely. Throw the disc in, push start. That's smooth, I like that. Push the start button and we should boot into a game. And there we go. So that's uh, how you repair drive belt in a Sega CD Model 1. So. Um, hopefully you can learn from some of my mistakes with taking this apart and putting it back together, but otherwise it's really not an overly difficult um, job to do. So this is part one. I'm going to make this, I think, a three-part series. Um, I have three different repairs, and I think it would just be easier to have three separate videos for it. The second one will be pretty straightforward, replacing the battery in it. So that should be a much quicker video, and part three will be, I'm going to try and recap some, one of those boards. So stay tuned for those. Those should be coming very soon. I'm hoping to have all three of them out by the end of the week, but we'll see how things go. Either way, thanks a lot for watching. I hope that uh, it was helpful or entertaining for some of you at least. Um, be sure to subscribe to my channel, get some notifications when I release new videos. Uh, like the video below and leave a comment. Let me know what you think. Thanks a lot again for watching and we'll see you next video.